Quay, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Silcox. I'm the Faculty Excellence Lead with uh, the Maple League of Universities, and I'm excited to welcome you to COVID, Networks, and Significant Conversations, Influencing Teaching and Learning Cultures in Higher Education with Dr. Natasha Kenny. Um, I'm joining you today from a beautiful day in Chpuktuk, uh, in unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, and we have people joining us from all across the country today, uh, from many, many time zones. Natasha, I know, has, has come to work quite early in the morning uh, to share with us. So I'll invite you to let us know where you're joining from in the chat. It's my really great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Natasha Kenny. Uh, who is Senior Director at the Taylor Institute of Teaching and Learning, and uh, a really prolific writer and speaker and thinker about how we teach and the future of universities. Um, I've been digging through her blog. This month marks the 12th anniversary of Natasha's blog, which is terrific. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop a link for that in the chat for you, because I really do suggest you go take a look. I dug, some of that old stuff is like still right on the money. So uh, kudos to you. Um, and Natasha uh, has invited me to, sh to share with everyone that um, there is a conference happening through the Taylor Institute uh, called Moving Forward in a Good Way, which is about Indigenous ways of knowing. And there's a call for papers open uh, for just another couple of days. So um, please consider that. Natasha, when is that, when is that conference actually taking place? Oh, great question. Uh, May 1st to 2nd, 2022, and the majority of, of which it will be on hosted online, so accessible to as many folks as possible. Wunderbar. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I'm going to turn myself off and I will throw over to uh, Natasha. Thank you very much. Please take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Neil. And thanks everyone for joining me today. I see folks are joining. Jackie, I think you're joining from Ireland, which is awesome to hear. And as I posted in the chat, I am joining from Treaty 7 region here in Southern Alberta, and which is also Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So here in the city of Calgary, um, there were some really important announcements made by the province late last night um, that we're all negotiating this morning. And my commitment to you is to be here and present uh, for the next hour um, as we really um, step back and think about uh, what has happened during the pandemic um, and how that relates to how we actually influence change in teaching and learning cultures. And just as I, I want to preface my uh, presentation by saying that um, this is a journey for me. This has been really helpful. Thank you, Neil and Jessica, for inviting me here um, because um, it's provided me with a valuable opportunity to step back and think about what are the conversations that has really influenced my thinking and my actions during the pandemic. Um, it's allowed me to step back and, and think about, okay, what are the key learnings that we've learned so far during the pandemic? And then also to reflect on what are the, the frameworks that are actually impacting um, my thinking as we move forward. Um, so that's kind of what I hope to share with you today. I'm hoping it will all come together um, and make sense. So I am engaging in some collective sense making here today. Um, and I know I'm in a safe space to make that happen. So just really excited uh, to be here with you today. Um, I also want to uh, state that I will leave time for dialogue at the end, but I know the chat of Zoom uh, creates this incredible informal back uh, or informal back channel to presentations and conversations. So do feel free to join in conversation with your colleagues or leave thoughts and reflections and questions in the chat throughout the presentation. So I'm gonna just take a second here to share my screen and remember to put it in presentation mode. There we go. Can everyone see that? Okay, step, step one done. We've got the screen share happening. So that's really great. Um, so I, I think everything for me goes back to Lee Shulman. Um, and I've really been reflecting a lot of Shulman's work on teaching and learning as community of property. And for me, this reminds us that the responsibility for teaching and learning never lies with one individual course instructor. It does not lie within the realm of one teaching and learning center. 
that we really need to take a systems and collective approach to thinking about how we support strong teaching and learning cultures, communities, and practices across higher ed. And I think his work in the early 90s continues to focus and influence how we think about teaching and learning in higher education. But I just want to reflect that during the pandemic, for me, this has never become more relevant. As I think about the many conversations that we've had about how we support teaching and learning through multiple units, through multiple conversations. I can think of the conversations I've had with IT, with facilities, with senior leaders, with the registrars, with the student experience office, with the students union, with grad studies. Um, just thinking about how each and every one of us has a stake and an important role to play in teaching and learning. The next kind of uh, key learning that has influenced me, and um, I'll, I'll take you back to when uh, this statement was made and when I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Michael Hart, who's the Vice Provost of Indigenous Engagement here at the University of Calgary. And um, I was going to my first meeting with an elder, uh, Elder Evelyn Goodstriker, to invite Evelyn to join in providing guidance and vision for a working group that we were working on. And I was really nervous going into the meeting. This was new to me. And Michael said simply, and it was a phone call, he said, Natasha, always remember relationships before tasks. And this simple but profound statement continues to influence my daily practice, not only, I think, in my professional life, but also in my personal life. Um, and I think right now, if we consider, the pandemic has been so task focused. We've been making quick decisions. We've been creating resources. Um, we've been getting stuff done. Um, and I think a lot of what we've been doing, we've been focusing on the doing of being human and we've forgotten about the being of being human. So I hope we can continue to bring more of the foundation of teaching and learning, which is grounded in relationship into our practices moving forward. I also want to share that in our re recent elder teaching here at the University of Calgary with Elder Betty Bestine as part of our elder teaching series, she really called for what she phrased a renewal of humanity, a focus on compassion, on kindness, on sharing and giving and gratitude. And in her words, this transcends beyond the localized self to the collective. I just got goosebumps saying that because I think, again, this is just a reminder of how important relationships are in our work. The kind of third conversation, and I guess it's a conversation that I continue to have with Jessica as I read her article, of course, that was published in um, University Affairs on critical hope and toxic positivity. And this uh, notion of critical hope, this concept of critical hope uh, really has, has, has really hit me quite strongly. And every time I read this article and I, I'll have references at the end of the slide, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to continue to read it. Um, I see something new in it all the time. But one of the things that I see every time that I read this article is that the more uncertain things get and the more challenging things get, the more we need each other to figure out the best path forward. Um, and that's really critical. So this notion of collective and shared decision-making is something that comes back to me over and over and over again. And for us, I think too, it's an important reminder of looking at students as partners and ensuring we are including all voices as we make decisions around teaching and learning, especially the student voice. Um, next, I'm going to reflect on the fact, and this is something we, this is something that uh, Leslie Reed, who our Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at the University of Calgary often reminds us of. And Leslie, of course, is a close colleague, somebody who I formally report into, but somebody who has provided extraordinary mentorship and support to me during the pandemic. And Leslie has reminded us consistently that change happens one conversation at a time. Um, 
I'd like to share that Leslie's superpower, and I remind, it, remind her of this, her leadership superpower is getting the right people in the room to help make decisions. Um, and again, I think um, in addition to folks like Parker Palmer, this reminds us that teaching and learning, again, is all about relationships and getting the right people in the room to have conversations about what is happening, about how to make sense of what is happening from multiple points of view, and how to determine the next right step. And the next right step might not always be a decision. It might be, as Leslie says, putting things uh, in the slow cooker and noodling on it and coming back to it. Um, but I guess I'm also starting to learn, especially from folks like Leslie, who's an extraordinary leader, that the best leaders have the courage to relinquish control and to foster shared decision making. And that's what we've learned so many times over and over during the pandemic. The next reflection I wanted to share with you is um, we were just recently, actually, I think it, last week or the week before we were asked, we were brought together in one of our committee meetings and it was actually Leslie who chaired the meeting, who took a, a minute, just like Neil did at the beginning of this meeting, but her minute was just to check in to see where people are at, just to share one or two words of where people are at. And for anybody who uh, really wants uh, one key, small, tangible change they can make in their approaches, that's a great uh, strategy to start any meeting often, to take that moment to step back and just really check in with folks. Um, and uh, Mary Grantham O'Brien, who is one of the associate deans here in the Faculty of Grad Studies, shared that right now it's just many tiny steps. And I, and I think it came from a, 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 a place of initial fatigue. But once Mary started sharing this, it really struck me that it really is these incremental tiny steps that are leading to transformative change right now. Um, and it's something it's really difficult to recognize because we are not stepping back to recognize and to document and to capture what those tiny steps were that are leading to this change. So it's, again, something that I reflect on. It's something, too, that I, um, I really describe my leadership approach as a conscious leadership approach. So that notion of what is that one right next step? It doesn't always have to be a leap. It can just be, what is that next conversation? What is that next tiny action, incremental action that I'm gonna take to move um, this decision, this resource, this uh, support, this conversation forward? Um, this is another reflection that I wanted to share. And this was from our uh, registrar, Amy um, Damwitz, who is a, our, a uh, relatively new registrar here at the University of Calgary, but who's a, an amazing colleague to work with. And Amy's reflection, this was just at the beginning of this past winter semester when we were determining an exemption process uh, for courses that were going to stay face to face when we made the decision to quickly uh, transition online due to the fifth wave of uh, the COVID pandemic. And Amy kind of put her, her head down and took a deep breath and said, we really have forgotten how to solve problems on a normal timeline. And post pandemic, we are going to need to take some time to really reflect on that. And I think just considering in my own leadership career, I can't believe how quickly things are happening right now. Um, things that once took months, like determining an exemption process for courses, literally are, are expected to take time um, in a matter of days. And this really is a completely unrealistic and unsustainable pace for us to sustain in, um, in higher ed right now. Related to that, I had a, a, a conversation with uh, Sheree Wilmer, who is the CRC chair uh, in, in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning just down the road from us here at Mount Royal University. Ironically, Sheree's been here for a year, a year or just over a year, and we haven't had a chance to connect personally, but we do once in a while over Zoom. And um, Sheree and I were just having a, a conversation about where we were both at, and she said, you know, I, I fear that we're making assumptions and predictions about where we're gonna be in the future in higher ed. And we really just, we haven't even taken the time to pause, to process, to reflect 
And I will add the word to heal. I think a lot of us are still um, impacted by uh, the trauma, the challenge, the anger, the frustration and fear of the pandemic. So that notion of, of healing is going to, to have to happen. Um, and, and so just really challenge us to think about, okay, right now where we're at, how are we taking the time individually and collectively to pause, to process, to reflect, to document and capture what we are learning and how we move forward. So those are some of the um, conversations that have really influenced us, but I did want to take some time to focus on, okay, what, what have we really started? What are we starting to learn during the pandemic? And, you know, we're seeing some scholarship come out in various contexts regarding what we are learning, but I think we need to see more. Um, and I hope that we will all be uh, contributing to conversations within our local context, but we'll also see more, more broadly in the literature about what the pandemic is teaching us in higher education. And I'm just going to highlight a few points here. Without a doubt, we have seen a dramatic disruption to our teaching and learning culture. We've seen a rapid adoption of, of teaching and learning technologies that we would never have imagined in the past. Consider that we are all on, all on Zoom meeting across Canada right now. This did not take place easily um, prior to the pandemic. Um, I think often we, we think about, okay, what, what innovative changes have we seen? But I think it's important to acknowledge that some of the most important changes we've seen are um, you know, access to video conferencing, are all instructors using the learning management systems, which didn't happen in the past, right? Are uh, us capturing um, various learning resources. We think of lecture capture, but I'd like to challenge us to think about um, accessing and creating online learning activities and resources rather than just lecture capture and students being able to ac access those resources over a much longer duration of time, including accessing um, online exams, um, open book exams, for example, over a 20, 24 hour period is an example there. We've also seen increased focus on teaching and learning across multiple levels. I think this is a gift of the pandemic. Uh, that never before have we seen um, more individual instructors thinking about what they're doing in their teaching and learning practices and adapting what they're doing about entire faculties and departments thinking about programmatic learning experiences and how we're supporting instructors in teaching and learning and what resources we have to support teaching and learning for both students and instructors and the staff supporting instruction. Um, but we're also seeing conversations about teaching and learning at an institutional level where we need more resources, we need a strong vision. We also have seen rapid changes in policies and standards related to teaching and learning that we just haven't seen in the past. We've seen an increased focus on infrastructure, and I think we're seeing more of that now, um, especially as we start to consider what the transition back to our on-campus spaces and environments will look like. So what technology are we providing in classrooms? What kind of agile technology are we providing in classrooms to allow instructors to uh, ensure participation of students that are not present in class, to allow that remote access, to ensure that we're capturing um, learning resources in a way that allows more access over time. Um, we're seeing, again, more thoughtful conversations about space. I'll use our example of our Schulich School of Engineering here, who during the pandemic has taken the time to uh, redesign many of their classroom spaces to have tables, mobile chairs to facilitate active and collaborative learning in as many spaces as possible. And then, of course, we're seeing more visible conversation um, around governance processes and planning processes that support teaching and learning across multiple levels and from multiple perspectives, whether that be our facilities, whether that be our wireless infrastructure and our how we're going to maintain some of the technology we've implemented over time. But I also want to highlight, and I also want to highlight the visible struggles that we've seen in higher ed around workload, around stress, around fatigue, around burnout, around well being, um, and around equity, diversity, and inclusion, and Indigenous engagement. We absolutely know 
that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted those that identify with equity deserving groups. And we need to have real conversations about how we are gonna address this into the future. So this takes me to a little bit of forecasting what we'll need into the future. And this really, I'm, I've tried to tie in some of the conversations from the beginning and some of those impactful conversations with what we're learning here. But I really think that we're gonna need time to process, to heal, to reflect, to ask critical questions, to document and to plan moving forward. And all too often I'm hearing already conversations about, okay, what do we need moving forward? How are we going to have more online or blended learning opportunities? And I think right now we, we really do need to take within each of our local contexts the time to step back and document uh, what are those experiences that instructors, that support staff have had, um, what are the conversations that have really impacted change over time so that we can really thoughtfully engage and learn moving forward. Um, we are going to see, and this is, uh, I quoted this, this is from the Blankelberger and Williams article, and again, I'll have these articles in the past, both of these articles, I really recommend folks read, um, but they talk about um, the fact that we will see pedagogical adaptation, and really, it's not going to be, I think, a wholesale transition to online learning for every course and every program in our institutions, we are going to see online learning complement face-to-face learning. We are gonna see more folks comfortable with learning, um, using learning technologies. Um, I think we're also going to see a continued need for those distributed and collective leadership approaches. And again, this is gonna be a dramatic change for some of us thinking about how are we relinquishing control? How are we also going back to our pre-pandemic governance processes and um, really empowering the, the, the academy to make um, decisions related to teaching and learning. I think, again, I think I've already mentioned this, but we are going to, and I think we already are here, um, engage in really honest conversations and action related to supporting equity, diversity and inclusion, Indigenous engagement and well-being. Never before, especially with this fifth wave, have I heard more people say, I'm just exhausted. I'm just fatigued. Um, we're going to have to take the time to um, think about how we're supporting each other um, through uh, as we move forward post pandemic. Finally, I think we're going to see a greater focus on relationships. Um, we're going to see uh, a need more focus on, on and, and visible conversations about kindness, compassion, respect, empathy um, in the academy. Um, and I think in the end, uh, I'd really hope that we have more intentional, flexible and agile decisions being made. So as we get there and here are the next few slides and I'll wrap up after these three slides is that um, what I think we need to reflect on is the importance of these informal processes and how they influence change. And some of my most transformative thinking in my practice as an educational developer and leader has been from Torgny Roxa and Katerina Martinson from Lund University. And they, their research really talked about, in addition to these formal processes that we have, the resources we create, the policies, the visions that we create, um, really teaching and learning cultures are dramatically impacted by the small but significant conversations we have by, with trusted colleagues. And those conversations are typically bound by privacy, by trust and intellectual intrigue. Uh, so I think we can all consider that. Who are the three to five people we talk about most um, deeply about our teaching and learning or leadership practices? And who, who are those folks that really influence us? Um, and I think here, what's most important is that we can be in a space where we have many of these significant conversations happening disparately across our organization, or we can think really thoughtfully um, across our institution about how we are sharing knowledge within and amongst these networks. So how are we creating 
what we refer to as integrated networks of practice that really facilitate knowledge sharing across our institutional context and across multiple organizational levels. And for me, this comes down to, and I, I reflect on this on my, uh, my blog, which Neil, thanks for pointing out, it is really dated. I had a goal of reinvigorating my blog practice over the last couple of years. So it's, it's coming back. It's coming back relatively slowly though. So please have patience with me. But really, um, this is how I've conceptualized my own thinking about how we really influence teaching and learning cultures across um, our institutions. Um, and in the middle of the framework, I think we really need to think beyond workshops, beyond uh, individual tip sheets about teaching and learning, and focus more on what are the higher impact professional learning opportunities that really uh, facilitate that relationship building, that sense of critical reflection, that knowledge sharing across uh, disciplines and development of teaching expertise over time, iterative development of teaching expertise over time and over multiple career stages. Um, we need to focus more on local level leadership. And here I'm talking about department heads, deans, associate deans, and how those, uh, that local level leadership and those microcultures that are happening at the meso level of the organization. So that's really in departments and units across working groups. Um, how are we supporting those individual leaders and their microcultures in influencing change? So do um, individual leaders have the, the, the training, the capacity, um, the, the sense of well-being and support to make the decisions they need, need to make in order to influence change in teaching and learning? We need to continue to engage in scholarship, research, and inquiry around teaching and learning. Um, and yes, that relates to the scholarship of teaching and learning, discipline-based educational research, medical education research, educational research, um, and also uh, Indigenous scholarship. I think we need to think really uh, more in our higher education community, how we are welcoming multiple forms of scholarship and multiple ways of being in our conversations about scholarship research and inquiry uh, related to teaching and learning. Um, we need to think thoughtfully about our spaces, pedagogies, and technologies. Um, that includes how we're supporting equity, diversity, and inclusion, and Indigenous perspectives in our curriculum, how we're supporting that physical infrastructure, how we're supporting the IT infrastructure to make change happen. All of this, again, is supported both by formal processes, but most importantly, by those informal processes, those significant networks, those relationships, by community, by conversation, and I think right now we've focused on, it's my right side, maybe your left side. We've focused on the formal processes more than the informal during the pandemic. And I hope we can have more visible conversations about that, those informal processes into the future. The bottom of this kind of framework recognizes that change uh, across these four kind of key components will always be influenced across multiple levels. At the micro level, by strengthening individual expertise at the meso level by strengthening faculties, departments and working groups and at the macro level really thinking about the institutional and or other that refer to mega level um, thinking about how we're really thinking about change across the post secondary sector as a whole. And finally, I just, I really wanna take some time to step back and, and, and bring us back to the importance of knowledge sharing and knowledge sharing across the institution. Because I think even during the pandemic, we're recognizing that yes, things are happening in individual working groups. Some individual faculties are moving forward with change quick, uh, more quickly than other. Some standards and policies are changing, but people are aware that they're changing and how they're changing and how that influences their teaching practice. So systems level thinking isn't easy, but what's most important within the context of this diagram is the center, is how are we enabling those hubs at the center of the network and providing resources to them? Think of the Maple League in order to influence change. Um, how are we providing meaningful connections? Think about this event where we're sharing knowledge together, our conferences that are hosted in teaching and learning, 
um, individual conversations that are happening in the unit level. So how are we providing those connections between these networks in order to ensure that knowledge is flowing across the institution? And then finally, how are we thinking about building those microcultures, about ensuring those microcultures are um, have access to uh, not only resources, but information in order to support the change we most hope to see in higher ed. So yes, we have our overall institutional culture, but think about all those communities and microcultures we have across the institution and how we're really ensuring um, that they can have that strong local impact that we most aspire to see. Um, and all of this recognizes, so when we're thinking about external connections, that of course we have disciplinary cultures that affect teaching and learning across our institution. And right now, more than ever during the pandemic, we have external, uh, I'll say connections here is highlighted, but maybe influences. Just think about how folks across the University of Calgary are reacting right now to the provincial announcements that were made last night. Um, and that all right now is dependent upon everything in the center of this diagram in terms of us making collective sense of that and us figuring out how we're going to move forward over the rest of the semester. So thanks for listening to my sense making. Um, I wanted to now just turn it over to folks to really consider uh, what you've just heard and you know, what, what's top of mind for you? Um, what formal and informal networks and processes have you seen emerge and influence teaching and learning during the pandemic in your own context? And even what's, what do you see as needed as we move forward to support teaching and learning into the future? So I think the easiest thing here, I'm gonna stop sharing my slides, stop share and just really open the conversation to all of you in an open uh, open dialogue for the remainder of the session. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, this is, <laughs> I'm so excited, I have so many notes. Um, we'd, love, we'd love for this to be a kind of free flowing conversation for the next 23 and a half minutes. Um, if you'd like to type, oh, Natasha, you just did the greatest thing, which is to type the thoughts into the chat. This is this is a pro. Um, we can run this at however you'd like. If you'd like to pop your camera on and put your hand up, uh, we can call you out. You can use the hand function in Zoom and you can type things into the chat and I'll moderate through the chat. I see you, Jackie, would you, do you have a thought or question you'd like to share? Oh gosh, thanks very much. Um, I, I really enjoyed this presentation so much. Um, I don't know if my comments are going to be on, on point, <laughs> but um, it's just vindicating everything that um, has been happening for me. I work um, for the International Kinesiology College, which is an organization outside of the university, but I've set up subtle processes over the last five or six years. And one of those is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, instructor community. And um, I also follow um, uh, Katrina Martinson's work um, um, and I'm um, very interested in these significant conversations and that's why I wanted to join you today. Um, but we have found this is a game changer. Initially, of course, at, at the meso level, I really had this experience of the microcultures where it just didn't work in my country, which is Ireland. But just by going to the UK where they were really open and it was a different microculture, it just has all taken off. And one of the things for us with having these conversations um, is that it led us when we got into this whole thing of having to go online <laughs> in the pandemic, that we were able to migrate very quickly into a, se a separate group online as well where people could support each other and it really actually while I thought it was going to be an ongoing thing that particular thing facilitating uh, online teaching and learning ended up just being for six months probably in in the first year in 2020. Um, I think the other thing that uh, struck me about Shulman was the snail's pace that things just go so slowly and that's why I think that this conversation for me is so important to realize that I'm not having these conversations just with myself in my head, <laughs> that, that there's something like being on the right, tra right track. So there's, there's real power in understanding that other people are having the, the same thoughts. 
um, I think I think that's there was there was uh, um, Natasha's conceptualize. I have to go back to that because that just made so much sense to me. Uh, but I'll have to yeah go back to that and relationships before tasks. I mean that absolutely says it, it just in one because that's what we're doing. I think I instinctively knew that, but I didn't have such a quote and. That is really something to hold on to. So thank you very much. Very, very uh, powerful for me. Oh, thank, thanks, Jackie. I really, you took me back. So I have to share the story of like the significant conversation, the significant conversation I had with Torgny Roxa. It was actually at the ISOTL conference. So the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning conference at McMaster University. I think that was in 2011, I want to say. Um, and I just happened to be in a presentation with Torgny and asked a question at the end of the conversation about communities of practice and what he thought about them. And, and after the presentation, he answered a bit, but he ran over to me with a napkin and drew this sketch, which is quite similar to the sketch you saw in the presentation. He's like, our research is showing um, that, you know, communities of practice are great, but they tend to be quite insular that we really need to focus more on these informal networks of practice. And he, have you thought about connecting them? And I was asked once, I think last year, did you keep that napkin? You should frame it. <laughs> I did not. But that conversation, I also at the time happened to be sitting next to Lynn Taylor, which really has led to my career here at the University of Calgary. And honestly, Jackie, I'm, I'm right with you in thinking about that. I, like, I can't tell you enough or I can't tell you honestly how many times that phrase relationships before tasks mm. has influenced me this year. And I know Lorelai, you are here. You've heard me say it in staff meetings. You've heard me say it multiple times. It is, it, it has profoundly impacted me over the last two years. Absolutely. And, and Jackie, the conceptualization of that one both those frameworks are written up in a, in a blog post and in a paper. So uh, no need to go back to your notes. Uh, they're documented. They're in the slides. Neil, I'm happy to share the slides. I've already shared the PDF. He can share them with all of you so you can access some of these articles. Great. Thank you so much. I'll share those in the, with a link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, Lorelai, did you have something to share? And then maybe Matthew? Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Natasha. It was what a wonderful way to start the morning and what a wonderful way, Neil, that you started the meeting. I'm going to have to definitely bore that because it really situated everybody in the context of what, why we're here. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. I love the way that you, um, Natasha, started off with some quotes. I'm not going to reiterate um, Michael Hart again, but really it is very impactful to think about relationships. And I'm thinking about the questions that you have in the chat, Natasha, and the, particularly kind of like going through them all in terms of creating space. Like in my work, what I've noticed is just creating that space for different faculties to share their learnings, to share their reflections, to share how they want to move forward, I think uh, has been really um, meaningful. And I'm hoping that in the future, as we move post pandemic, that we still have those spaces available and then we still are able to maintain those connections and relationships and not always to get together to, you know, for that specific task, but just to get together to connect. And from those connections and conversations, really great ideas happen. So I'm hoping that we can still continue to have, um, create those spaces, whether they be formal and communities of practice or more informal. So I'm wondering, um, my question is, as I'm wondering for you, how do you see those opportunities continuing to have those spaces without, with everyone trying to, you know, now pivoting, especially in Alberta with the announcement, now, you know, with all the changes, people are gonna be very busy, their time is gonna be pressed. Um, you talked about pedagogical adaptation. So do you see that, still see that there's space and importance to have those meetings happen where they're conversation-based as opposed to task-based? Yeah, absolutely, Lorelai. And a couple of things come immediately to mind. So A, um, for any of you who kind of facilitate formal workshops or events, it's less about the content that we present and more about the conversations we facilitate. So that's my first kind of 
like, and I think it, it's one thing to present and ground our conversations in scholarly practice, but I really challenge all of us to provide meaningful time for, as you said, Lorelei, uh, to really critically reflect on their own practices, assumptions, beliefs about teaching and learning, um, and to share meaningfully in their wisdom and experience of practice across disciplines. So I, I think that's one thing that I see more and more. And I think the other thing for us especially within teaching and learning centers is to let go a little bit to recognize that those, as Jackie mentioned, that peer conversation and dialogue is really critical. And I just want to provide an example at the University of Calgary. Prior to the pandemic, we had launched what was called the online learning project, which we thought was really transformative. And Gavin, I'll just point to you because it really builds upon some of your learnings when you were at Western about bringing a small group of colleagues together, 10 at the time, I think, to transform 14 courses into an online environment. And we got about eight months into this one year project where we were working specifically with these 10 instructors on 14 courses when the pandemic hit. Well, unbeknownst to us, what happened is those 10, and just think about this network, those 10 became those knowledge catalysts and champions in their local context where they were working individually with pairs. We were not creating formal processes to make this happen. They were called upon to help influence that change. So I think we can also see, and Jackie, I think you pointed out too, the importance of that meso level and how really ensuring that our faculties, units, and departments and working groups have the resources and capacity to influence change at that level as well. So um, those are a couple of key examples that I'll just share with you that, that come top of mind. Wonderful, thank you. Matthew, did you have something to share? And then I have uh, some words from Angie in the chat. Oh no! I just put my my screen oh, on just to thanks, Matthew. Just audience. for just to be here. <laughs> Pass it to the end. <laughs> uh, in that case, um, Angie uh, from Santa Fex uh, shares through the chat. Thanks, Natasha. Very thoughtful and timely too. I really worry that many will go back to the way it was before the pandemic. That we will not take advantage of the various ways we have learned to become more student centric in our teaching and learning practices. I have realized in the work I'm currently doing that our approaches to teaching colleagues have to be diverse, addressing so many unique issues, some based on discipline, training, etc. We also have to convince the administration that we should not go back to the way it was, and that there is not a one size fits all solution. Yeah, Angie, I agree. And both of those points are not easy to address. So I'm going to share two things. The one I'm just going to say about our the ability to work with teaching colleagues that have diverse issues and unique training. And um, Lorelai, I'll actually point as an example, I'm going to point to two things. One is that when Gavin and I worked together at the University of Guelph, we really took a collaborative approach to facilitating um, many of our workshops and projects. And that was really transformative to our own practice, to our own professional learning and growth, I think, but also in our ability to support teaching colleagues. So I hope we will see more of that across our teaching and learning centers, that kind of collaborative approach to, to educational development practice. Um, and I think we have a large project happening at the University of Calgary uh, based on a really generous donation from the um, Flanagan Foundation. And we're really working to think about how we meaningfully advance online and blended learning. And recently I met with one of the academic leads on that project and she shared the list of things they were doing. And each thing had a, a lead and who we're collaborating with in the TI. And I was so impressed by that. So that collaborative approach is I think really important because our work of influencing change is incredibly difficult. It's vulnerable, it's challenging. I feel there are more tensions as we're going into the conversation. So we kind of need that collective approach. And the next component of convincing admin, and here's where I see real strengths in the approaches we've taken at the University of Calgary. 
So even now, um, I will state that yesterday, prior to the announcement, we have a really collaborative approach to decision making. And here's where I think, I hope that in many spaces, uh, that um, administration or those in executive or senior leadership positions do have the courage to relinquish control and to seek input and advice from others. So we have a number of different working groups that not only include input from the Taylor Institute, but also from the Faculty of Graduate Studies, also from the Registrar, also from the Students' Union, also from the Faculty Union and spaces. So we, we really do need to take that shared decision-making approach as we move forward. Um, and I am hopeful based on the transition and change and our ability to make really quick and meaningful and intentional decisions during the pandemic that will continue uh, post pandemic. And if that isn't happening at your organization, you know, where can we have those small but meaningful conversations with others who are at those tables to influence change? Hopefully I touched on a couple of the points you had there. I feel like you did. I, <laughs> having said it, I feel like, oh, super. I've also got a great comment from, oh, and Angie says, thanks, Natasha, helpful as needed and needed, pardon me, in the chat. And I have a comment from Julia Riley. Um, Thank you, Natasha. I really enjoyed your talk. There's a lot of good things to be mindful of. One thing I often think about is in regards to life after, in quotation marks, the pandemic is working to rebuild and bolster our communities teaching in this case, or just generally within a university. Our communities have changed during the pandemic. People have joined us and others have left. And I think that rebuilding those relationships and creating spaces for that to happen is important moving forward. Yeah, I don't know what else to say, but to say plus that comment and amplify that comment is like, it, I think this, Again, we're, we're, we're coming back to healing, rebuilding relationships, acknowledging what's happened. And I think one of the key focus, focuses that we have right now, we've actually seconded an academic uh, faculty member to the Taylor Institute who will be working right now to uh, capture some of those key learnings and to foster dialogue across our campus community about what we've learned, uh, what we, what, you know, what, what innovative practices would we like to keep? And what would we like to let go of? What really hasn't worked? Um, and I think that what would we like to get let go of and what hasn't worked is, is equally important. And the other conversation I think that we've been urged by our provost, uh, Dr. Terry Balser to consider lately is honestly, what are we gonna step back and pause and slow down um, because we, we can't keep doing it. it the, the pace that we're sustaining right now is completely unsustainable. So I just, I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, and this touches on something that I have been ruminating on since you first brought it up that I feel like there is no, it's not like before the pandemic, we were like, God, we got all this time kicking around in our schedules, you know? <laughs> I wonder if anything will come up. And so, I mean, I wonder, where we will find that time for reflection and healing when in, in the after or in the now, you know, we need it just as much right now as we do. Um, and, and it makes me think about how, you know, that the idea of perpetual urgency is, yeah. is part of the way the system maintains itself and makes sure that change doesn't happen and, and is a tool of, you know, racism and white supremacy and all those things by saying, well, we don't have the time to make changes because actually it's really important. We got to get marks in before the 19th, you know, or whatever that is. So I don't know how we carve out time uh, for this, especially as, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I work for the Maple Leaf, but I was also a part-time teacher. So like I'm driving between places and, and I, I would love that reflection time, but I don't feel like it's given to me from, from above, you know? Those are, that, that's a, I'm not sure I have the solution, but I, Neil, I just love the phrase perpetual urgency and I may quote you in the future. I just, I just want to plant that seed right now. Um, I feel like I stole it from someone. So I don't, I'll see if I can okay. suss it out and send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all, we'll all make sure we attribute that well. Um, I think, okay, so I want to, I, I want us to consider what Neil mo modeled at the beginning of this session. Um, it was two minutes of checking in and time for reflection. 
all of us have the time to do that. And I really do um, urge us all to model um, activities and actions such as that, that allow us to bring the heart back into our work. And there was one paper um, that I uh, quoted in my uh, presentation that I just, sorry, I'm flipping slides here to make sure I get the authors right. Um, I'm just gonna put it in the chat here. I really was influenced by this paper this weekend. Um, and it really talked about um, the importance of checking in with each other. Um, and I think that's really critical and important. From a policy and structural standpoint, uh, and I'm just going to touch on the equity, diversity, inclusion, and Indigenous engagement piece, uh, we need to make really uh, important and bold changes in higher education that includes uh, collecting the right information and data to make informed decisions, ensuring that we have appropriate representation in our communities, ensuring that we have appropriate leadership. So I know um, Drs. Melinda Smith and Dr. Michael Hart, who are uh, leaders of the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and the Office of Indigenous Engagement at the University of Calgary have really uh, been inspiring us to think more deeply about these changes. So I think what I'm getting at there is that there's both informal and formal ways we can make this happen. And there's both individual and collective ways we can make this happen. And honestly, Neil, I don't think we're going to have a choice as we move into the future, um, especially when it comes to meaning, meaningful conversations about workload. And one of the things we've been thinking a lot about into the future is thinking about, okay, we're going to have to make strategic and intentional decisions. So what are our key priorities? How are our current um, activities across multiple organizational levels aligning with those strategic priorities? And what are we going to stop, pause, and let go of as we move forward? So um, yeah, no simple answer there. And I think a really important point, but that was just some things that came to top of mind to me right now. Thanks very much. I, I, I like talking through the complexity. And if there was a simple answer, I think we'd all, you know, s someone out there would be a millionaire. <laughs> um, Tony's got their hand up. Uh, Tony, would you like to share a thought or question? Sure. Um, firstly, I uh, thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, I enjoyed that thoroughly. Um, hi, Jackie in Ireland. I love Ireland. Um, I really do. <laughs> and um, so I, I'm thinking about uh, the comment that Angie was making and, and you replied to. And one of the things that I'm noting or experiencing on our, our campus at Mount Allison um, is, of course, part of the Maple League and there's an identity component and that identity component to being face-to-face -face. and people uh, who are administrators the narrative has been return to normal I mean we've heard that several times it's a narrative that keeps being repeated but faculty are also repeating that so it's not just I think a shift that um, at least on our campus that we need to see in administration in terms of you know, EDID, for example, I was at a conference all day yesterday on EDID, and these very issues were coming up in terms of the, the lessons we learned from COVID, the lessons we learned from the technology and being online and what have you. And so there's a lot of resistance from our faculty. And I'm wondering, I'm not, I'm not saying that, Natasha, you have the answers. So please don't take it, don't take it that way. It's more of a thought, I suppose. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, geez, what can we do uh, with those folks who are resisting and just want to go back to normal? Why? Because it means they don't have to think about their pedagogy or delivery or the technology so much. Yeah, one of the things I heard there and that I reflected on as you were sharing that, and one of the conversations that we've really been working on here is focusing less necessarily on modality and more on the student learning experience and what's best for the student learning experience. And I say that, because, and I'll reflect on an example that's happening currently here at the University of Calgary. 
Um, what will be happening in on March 1st will look very different in faculties like the Faculty of Social Work than it will in the Faculty of Arts and Science. And for really good reason, because our Faculty of Social Work is very distributed. There's three different campuses and many of the learners in that program are adult learners that are currently caregivers um, that need flexibility right now. Um, so I see a faculty like the Faculty of Social Work and again, here's where another key change that I hope institutions see is letting the academic programs make those decisions based on what's best for student learning experiences in their particular context. So for, I anticipate that the Faculty of Social Work will have many more online learning opportunities even when we return back face-to-face -face on March 1st or on February 28th. Um, should, I'm quoting Jason Kenny here too, now should, should, should we see a decline in the number of cases? There's that caveat there. Um, so I guess that's, that's one um, thing I've been reflecting on a lot is, is putting more emphasis on those student learning experiences and gathering information and data in order to inform our decisions as they move forward. Super, and Anne? Uh, I see your hand, and I think this will be our last opportunity for a thought or comment. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, it's not really a question so much as I've been thinking through this entire talk and it's bouncing off what Tony and Angie were saying before too. I've been thinking about the importance of discomfort, right? And, and the thing that, that um, like white settler folks learn through doing EDID work is that we have to sit with discomfort and the race to sort of get past it, right? To say, you know, I'm a good anti-racist, I'm a good white person, whatever, is the refusal to kind of sit with discomfort and, and what that, that generates, right? Um, and then, you know, this entire year, I'm at UPEI. I mean, we've, we've just barely got a TLC kind of starting again this year. Um, sorry, Charlene, I know you're here. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it started as a part time and then it, it became like, here's a few more hours. And, and so through the entire sort of first year of the pandemic, we had pretty well nothing. We had an e-learning office, but we had no kind of, of um, teaching and learning center. Anyways, all of that to say that that the mantra is the return to normal. Right. Um, and that comes from senior admin. But like Tony points out, it comes from a lot of our faculty colleagues also. And I find myself wanting to say to everyone, like, just let's sit with with the discomfort, like what has been so awful and just dis and dis not awful, discomforting right in, about our teaching and learning for the last two years and use that as generative rather than think that that's the thing that we have to race through right and just forget about like at some point we'll we'll never tell stories about these two years right we'll just say oh yeah <laughs> and be back to whatever we were doing it's like and i don't want to do that i have learned so much in the last two years about teaching and learning and all sorts of stuff and i'm thinking with a lot of other people about what are we going to do with all of that so i guess it's just a plea for discomfort and discomfort is generative as opposed to that sort of awkward, awful thing that you have to race through and get out of. I love that statement. And I think absolutely. And having leaders that can lean into um, and navigate uh, challenging conversations and critical conversations, I'll even say, is so important. And one of the practices that I will share with you all today is um, and, and it's going to happen tomorrow. I'll, I'll, this is this is in real time here. We knew an announcement was coming yesterday. We know there are going to be real questions and challenges coming from faculty that our associate deans teaching and learning are hearing right now. Um, our vice provost teaching and learning and our COVID academic issues team will be getting together with all associate deans teaching and learning tomorrow just to capture. And this is the point of the meeting. There will be relatively, if any, any responses or answers to their questions, but just tell us and we'll capture them. What are the questions and concerns you're hearing? We then take those back to the provost for the crisis decision or for the COVID decision-making team to hear now, these are the things that are happening. These are the things that are emerging. So that's just one example, I think of a really critical leadership practice that allows us to start to capture some of that um, uh, discomfort, discontent, um, and, 
and to, to engage in those critical conversations about what this is broken, like this isn't working right now. And what are we going to do? So thanks for bringing that up. Anne. Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you, Natasha. This has been such a great talk. There's more questions coming in in the chat that we just don't have time for. I'm sorry to say uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh,